today I am going to walk through how I built the giant 11 by 11 ball, the design challenges, the 3D printing process, and the assembly. If I made the giant 11 by 11 ball totally solid, it would weigh 131 pounds. I know this because of math. Weight minimization is a central problem in building the giant 11 by 11 ball. I am no stranger to the weight minimization problem. The best way to minimize weight is to have as much hollow space as possible. However, giant n by ns typically have very little hollow space on the inside. For this video, I won't go into depth for how big cube mechanisms work, but notice here that there are a lot of long pieces that reach very far into the center of the cube. This eats up most of the cube's volume and leaves only the small hollow space in the middle. But we need a large hollow space in the middle, so I had to think outside the ball on this one. My solution was to invent a brand new big cube mechanism that maximizes hollow space. The first thing I did was design this giant 3x3 three three ball to act as a frame and hold in the many smaller pieces. If it's hard to see how this is just a 3x3, three three, note that it has all of the same pieces. Center pieces, edge pieces, and corner pieces. A big advantage to designing the 3x3 frame like this is it allows for a large amount of hollow space here. So the frame is just a giant shell approximating the surface of a sphere, and you can see the interesting way that the corners and edges interlock with each other. Neither the corner or the edge can be pushed in or pulled out which is going to make our frame very stable. This allows all the tiny centers to gently rest on the frame and interlock with each other so they don't fall out. If we look at a 2D slice of the entire mechanism, it's more obvious how the pieces interlock with each other and interlock with the frame. By isolating two of the small center pieces, we can see that neighboring parts interlock with each other, making sure there's no way for them to fall out. And that's it. I'm happy with the design, so it's time to send it off to the 3D printers. After a part is finished with the design process, I need to create instructions for my 3D printers to make the part. This step is called slicing, and it's called that because 3D printers need to print parts layer by layer, and each layer is a 2D section or a slice of the part it's trying to print. There are a lot of slicing settings. It's pretty easy to make slicing errors, and they can sometimes end in catastrophe. The 20 by 20 exploded because of a mistake I made when slicing the parts. So getting the slicing right is just as important as getting the design right. The biggest unsolved issue with household 3D printers is that they cannot print in midair. The plastic that comes out of the printer needs to bond to a surface. If there's nothing below the liquid plastic, it'll spew out of the printer like spaghetti. Let's reduce this problem into its simplest form, which is just trying to print an arch like this. If a printer tried to make this arch, it would eventually get to a point where a lot of the material would be printed in mid-air. Notice that this print starts out totally fine, but once it reaches a certain height, something weird happens. This is obviously not how we want this part to look, but luckily, slicers have a few ways to prevent issues like this. One way to make this arch printable is to enable something called support material. You can see the support material here in green. It's printed directly under the arch, where there are large overhangs. This will prevent the arch from collapsing downwards, and at the end, the support material can be snipped right off. you might have also noticed that the arch printed fine up until a certain point. Amazingly, printers can print overhangs up to a certain extent. I personally prefer overhangs over supports because ripping off supports can get very time consuming. Now that you understand slicing, let's get back to my giant ball. All of the centerpieces, 
take this general form. I needed to decide the general orientation to put these centers down on the print bed for slicing. There's this way, which would work, but as you can see, requires support material. Similarly, we have this orientation, which uses even less support material. However, I realized in this situation that I can actually take advantage of the fact that these printers are kind of good at printing overhangs. That's when I saw this print orientation, which doesn't use any supports. The reason I know this will work is because these angles are roughly 45 degrees, which I know my printers can handle. The only issue I see with this print orientation is that there isn't a lot holding this piece onto the print bed. As you can see here, this is all of the plastic that will be in the first layer, and it's not enough. There's a lot of material resting on that one tiny spot, and this would definitely fall over if we tried to print it. My solution was to go back into the design and change this curved edge to a flat edge. Now that this is flat, it's gonna have a lot more area to connect the piece to the print bed. I figured this wouldn't be too noticeable in the final puzzle because these flat edges are roughly the same shape as these curved edges. And that's it, this center can print without supports and as you can see here, there's a lot more material attaching it to the print bed. This looks like enough material to me. There's one final thing I decided to do to the design. You can see here that all of the center pieces look roughly the same. This will make them very hard to distinguish once I'm trying to assemble it, and it could get easy to mix parts up. So what I did is I numbered all the pieces and I imprinted the numbers here on the bottom. If you want, you can pause this to try and figure out the numbering system I used. Next, I prepared all the prints, where each print is a large batch of pieces so that I won't have to manually change the prints too frequently. Next, I sent the files over to my 3D printers and let the magic happen. I haven't mentioned the wings yet, which are these parts. Notice that they're split down the middle. This is because they need to be two different colors. So I printed them in two halves and glued them together like this. Next, I had to 3D print the core, which is this big central piece that all of the centers can screw into. This core is weirdly shaped and won't fit on my 3D printers because it's too big. So I had to come up with a creative way to make this core. My solution was to print each of the core arms individually and super glue them all to a central cube. I just glued this piece on and I added this rubber band securing it in place. I think a lot of people who build puzzles over engineer their cores. They can be really simple. They can just be sticks, cubes, and super glue. <laughs> That's all you really need. I don't completely trust the super glue to keep the core together, so I drenched it with epoxy as an extra safety measure. I lubricate all of my 3D printed puzzles with pure silicon oil. And I use a lot. 3D printed puzzles love lube. I'm yet to experience a situation where I use too much. After assembling the frame, I took some time to break it in.
I added lube as I was going, making sure to get every single layer. heavy this is it the giant 11 by 11 ball you might have noticed that i'm on the floor there are two main reasons why i am on the floor reason one i am scared to put this on a table reason two you need your entire body to turn this thing That's a, a turn of a bunch of layers on the giant 11 by 11 ball. Let's try out some patterns. <laughs> oh yeah, that is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Matt Bonner. This is the Giant 11 by 11 Ball. Thank you for watching, and like and subscribe, or else. <laughs>